unfortunately Derek Pearl is not going to be with us today, so we're gonna I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panelist Melissa Bartholomew. Uh, Melissa is a doctoral candidate in public history at UC, uh, UCSB, and her dissertation focuses on memorial projects and political responses in the wake of mass shootings. Since June of 2014, she has served as a project manager for UCSB's May 23, 2014, uh, May 23, 2014, Isla Vista Memorial Collection Project. From Melissa, and our second panelist is Ruth Hellier Tanaka. I hope I did not completely. Uh, which are that. Um, Ruth is a scholar and creative artist focusing on experimental performance making, community and environmental arts, and performance in Mexico. Her publications include um, Embodying Mexico, Tourism, Nationalism, and Performance of Women Singers in Global Contexts, Music, Biography, Identity. She is the editor of the multidisciplinary bilingual journal uh, Mexican Studies and Estudos Mexicanos, which is published by USC Press. And she's an associate professor in the Department of Music at UC Santa Barbara. So we can have our Melissa uh, come up here. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for all the work I have seen. Las Vegas, Orlando, Virginia Tech, Roseburg, Oregon, and Isla Vista. These are all communities that have suffered a mass shooting and have had a nearby university create a condolence collection project that documents the memorial responses to these acts of violence. In each of these situations, members of the university have worked directly with grieving family members and friends of the victims as well as the survivors to create remembrance events that bring community members onto the campus and members of the university out into the surrounding community. By the nature of these sudden and tragic events, new relationships are quickly formed between groups that would otherwise not interact in such emotionally intense and intimate ways. One common pattern in the wake of these mass shootings is for people both on campus and off, to advocate for gun reform in order to prevent future killings. This paper examines the roles that survivors and family members of victims of mass shootings have played in the gun violence movement by looking at two primary case studies, the shooting at Pulse nightclub in Orlando, Florida, that occurred on June 12, 2016, and the violence that occurred on May 23, 2014, in Isla Vista, California, at the edge of our UC Santa Barbara campus, where I'm a graduate student. So those of you who aren't familiar, I this does just that way, just a couple blocks. Um, for the past three years, I have worked with the families and friends of the victims of our tragedy in Isla Vista, and for more than a year, I've been working with the community of Orlando regarding their efforts to create a permanent memorial and museum. Unwilling to feel hopeless, numb, and immobilized, communities often come together to advocate for change and to assert individual and collective agency. Administrators, faculty, staff, and students here at UC Santa Barbara and at the University of Central Florida in Orlando have found ways to expand the definition of community by embracing the family members and friends of the victims, as well as the survivors and eyewitnesses to these horrible killing sprees. Together, they have embarked on public art programming, such as museum exhibitions and concerts, to honor those who were killed and injured and to draw a larger meaning from these acts of violence such as the need for sensible gun laws in the United States. For those of you who are unfamiliar with our campus and surrounding community, Isla Vista is an unincorporated residential and business community adjacent to the UC Santa Barbara campus. A large percentage of UCSB students and students at Santa Barbara City College reside in Isla Vista. According to the 2010 census, just over 23,000 persons were living in Isla Vista, and 85% of those residents were in the 18 to 24 year old age group. It was in uh, Isla Vista that a 22 year old ma male named Elliot Rogers, who was not affiliated with UCSB, went on a violent crime spree where he stabbed to death his two roommates and their friend, and then went on a rampage striking pedestrians with his vehicles and shooting at them. He killed six people who all happened to be UCSB students. 
and he injured another 14 individuals. During the rampage, police on foot engaged Rogers in gun battle, and he committed suicide by shooting himself in the head and crashing his car. I was in the area during the crime spree. <clears throat> I witnessed the perpetrator speeding past me in his vehicle, and I saw part of the emergency response. I felt like I needed to do something to help our community heal, so I immediately became involved with the crisis response on campus and in Isla Vista. Eventually, I was asked by undergraduate students to find a way to preserve the condolence items that had been left at the four spontaneous memorial sites in Isla Vista. In addition to teddy bears, flowers, and candles, there were numerous paintings, photographs, cards, and letters, many of them written by friends and family members of the victims. I agreed that these items should be kept, and I was able to get permission from our special research collections department at the UCSB library to create a condolence collection and preserve these artifacts for future use by scholars and for use in future exhibits. In January 2015, I was asked by our library to curate a memorial exhibit for the one-year memorial anniversary. My project team members and I were able to collaborate with the public history program and have two history professors teach a class that had a practicum component. Several of the groups of students processed artifacts into our collection at the library, and another group of students helped create a memorial exhibit, which I curated and was titled, We Remember Them Acts of Love and Compassion in Isla Vista. Actually, let me go ahead and bring you the flyer. The premise of the exhibit was that the condolence items left at spontaneous memorial sites and the memorial events organized in the wake of the tragedy, each represented an act of love and compassion. The exhibition had eight separate rooms spread out over 6,000 square feet. For me personally, the most important room featured biographical sections on each of the six students who were killed, as well as a section that paid tribute to the survivors and the eyewitnesses. That's a photo of that particular room. I worked directly with the parents of the victims to select a photograph of their child, a quote that they thought embodied their outlook on life, and together we wrote biographical statements that honored their child. Two sets of parents asked that we include flowers in the exhibition, and as a result, Debbie Fleming, who at the time was our Dean in Student Affairs, created bouquets of silk flowers that we displayed. We also had origami cranes that our students had made right after the tragedy that we hung from the ceiling, and we personalized, and personalized items that had been left at spontaneous memorial sites were also exhibited in exhibit cases. You can see um, from the photograph here that the crane is hanging from the ceiling in the middle, um, kind of behind and above the exhibit case that had items that um, were left for those particular victims, as well as messages um, to those who were injured. Another important room in our exhibition focused on efforts to draw larger meanings from this mass killing and included a section on gun violence prevention. That's the, that's the room. We had photographs of Richard Martinez, who is the father of one of our victims, Christopher Ross Michaels Martinez. Mr. Martinez was immediately outspoken about the need for gun reform. At the sheriff's press conference, he made a passionate plea. With all the cameras, all the news cameras pointed at him. Martinez shouted into the microphone, why did Chris die? Chris died because of craven, irresponsible politicians in the NRA. They talk about gun rights. What about Chris's right to live? When will all this insanity stop? When will enough people say, stop the madness? We don't have to live like this. Too many have died. We should say to ourselves, not one more. The phrase, not one more, became a rallying cry at our university and around the nation. When his son was killed, Martinez was working as a defense attorney in a private practice in San Luis Obispo. He knew that the media's attention would be short-lived, and he immediately channeled his grief into political action. He offered to speak on behalf of the families of the victims for campus memorial service. During his speech, he encouraged all 22,000 people to join him in a chant of not one more. It is hard to express in words how powerful this moment was with so many people leaping to their feet and raising their fists in the air, joining him in this chant, a testimony to the pain, the anguish, and the outrage that so many felt. There were dozens of news networks covering our campus memorial, and video footage of this chant was shown all around the nation and the world. Eventually, Martinez quit his private practice to work full-time for Every Town for Gun Safety, the nation's largest lobbying organization for common-sense gun laws. 
As part of his work with Every Town, Martinez launched his Not One More physical and digital postcard campaign. Over 600,000 Americans sent more than 2.4 million postcards to elected officials. In this uh, photograph in the middle, or no, I'm sorry, on the left, he's holding a stack of the postcards he personally delivered to the members of Congress. The photo in the right has him pulling um, a writer uh, wagon full of those postcards as he was going through um, the halls. And then on the right, there's a picture of him meeting with um, one of the politicians. I apologize, it's kind of dark, but where we had our exhibit, there was not a lot of natural light or windows, so even with uh, our top photographers, um, it still had kind of a yellowing effect. Martinez is still employed by every town and is considered to be one of the nation's leading experts on gun violence epidemic, and he is regularly speaking about this on CNN and other news networks. Here's a better photograph um, that we were given from every town for a display. In our exhibition, we also included exhibit cases with items such as t-shirts, jewelry, cards, paintings, and candles that included the message, not one more. To our surprise, three of the other sets of the families um, of the victims arrived on a private tour of our exhibit, and they had brought with them a banner that they made that said, not one more student victim. Here's the banner that they uh, brought with them from where they live in the Bay Area when they came for their tour. They were eager to have us hang up this banner while well, they were there to see us do it, and so they literally helped us nail it to the wall, which was yet another example of their eagerness to be part of this process of creating the exhibit together, and also signified their desire to fight for gun reform. Another parent who has played a large role in gun violence prevention advocacy is Bob Weiss, the father of one of our victims, Veronica Weiss. Mr. Weiss is an active volunteer with the Brady Campaign to prevent gun violence and travels around the nation assisting other communities that have recently suffered mass shootings. As Weiss has put it, he is a member of the National Organization of Parents of Murdered Children, a club that no one ever wants to belong to. As such, he has found it healing to help support others by sharing some of the expertise he has developed through the years. He sees it as his mission and responsibility to try to prevent other parents from the pain of having a child lost to gun violence. As he once said about his daughter, though she didn't know it at the time, Veronica Weiss was a soldier who made the ultimate sacrifice in the war against gun violence. Honoring her and all of the victims by remembering them strengthens our resolve to work toward a future where our nation no longer suffers nearly 100 innocent deaths by gun every day. Arguably, focusing on the individual lives lost through gun violence protests the anonymity of mass death that seems to be characterizing the times that we are currently living in. As mass casualty rates seem to be increasing, as evidenced by the shooting last month in Las Vegas that left 58 people dead and more than 546 people injured, it seems increasingly essential to argue for the value of life itself. I had the privilege of working closely with Weiss on a concert that occurred in September 2015 in Santa Barbara that was part of the national effort called Concert Across America to End Gun Violence. Oh, let me bring you the flyer. I have it, uh, we made it in color, but for some reason I was having trouble finding the color version, so that's it in black and white. There were concerts in over 200 cities all on the same day, and Santa Barbara was the second largest venue. Weiss served as chairman for our committee, and there were a number of UCSB students and staff who also assisted with the organizing efforts. Here's um, a photograph of the Arlington Theater um, where we had the concert. The concert, Weiss spoke about his personal loss and the need for gun violence prevention. There were many speakers and performers affiliated with UCSB, including Naked Voices, UCSB's premier co-ed a cappella group. This was especially significant since they have sung in all of the vigils we've had in honor of the victims and survivors of the May 23rd, 2014 Vista massacre. This is a photograph of just some of the um, conference, or, um, concert organizers. And this is a photograph of three of the members from our Naked Voices a cappella group performing at the concert. So one of the ch challenges with the concert was that organizers, including Weiss, Get there in a second. One of the challenges of the concert was that the organizers, including Weiss, originally wanted UCSB to host the concert on campus, and when that didn't work out, they still wanted the university to donate funds. 
Because of the political nature of the event, the university administration did not feel comfortable in contributing funding and other resources directly to the event, especially given our political climate currently. For similar reasons, the chancellor was also unwilling to speak publicly at the event. He was unsure whether he should even attend. I encouraged him and other administrators to attend in order to show their support of the families of our victims, and I let them know that it would mean so much to the families who were going to be attending and had been helping organize the event. He ended up uh, attending along with his wife, Dilling, and they were publicly acknowledged, acknowledged with the other public figures in attendance. And additionally, many people, including our chancellor, had been concerned about the security of the venue. Our committee did end up receiving death threats in the mail, such as the one I'm going to show you here. This flyer includes a photograph of Jackson Brown, who was the headliner for the concert in New York City, and it threatens to kill him. We ended up hiring a private security company that required attendees to pass through metal detectors and also have their bags searched. Each time there has been a mass shooting in our local community in Isla Vista and at UC Santa Barbara, we've teamed up to hold solidarity vigils and events demanding gun reform. Here's a photograph of uh, Bob and Rich in the middle behind the banner I'm on the far right there. Um, this one was held as part of the effort called Rising for Charleston, which featured solidarity vigils in honor of the nine African Americans who were killed at the AMA church shooting in Charleston, South Carolina. Weiss Martinez and I have also done solidarity work in Orlando, Florida, in the wake of the Pulse nightclub shooting. In case you aren't familiar, the Pulse nightclub shooting occurred on June 12, 2016. 49 people were killed and 68 people were injured by a gunman during a Latinx night at the LGBTQ plus nightclub. This was the largest number of people killed and injured by a single gunman in U.S. history until the recent shooting in Las Vegas at an outdoor country music festival. Here's a, oops, sorry, I'm too fast. Here is a slide, or a photograph rather, uh, that I took of a banner that was hanging in front of the spontaneous memorial salt site at Pulse Nightclub during the one year memorial anniversary this past June. It says, bullets cannot break our pride. More love, less hate, hashtag Orlando strong. There are still hundreds of memorial items continually being left in front of Pulse, and the family members of the victims still visit the location every day. I should say some of the family the victims um, are there every day. While I was in Orlando this past June, I also had the opportunity to attend an exhibition at the Art Gallery at the University of Central Florida that was called Resilience Remembering Pulse. It commemorated the one year anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting. In the words of the curators, it presented photographs, quilts, paintings, films, and installations that respond to the tragedy and exemplify themes of remembrance, resilience, and resistance. It featured work by students, faculty, staff, and community members, and the exhibition celebrated the lives of the victims, engaged with social and political issues, and demonstrated the power of love to triumph over hate. This photograph here provides um, an overview of at least half of the uh, gallery space itself. You can see there's different art pieces that students and community members created, including on the back right, this um, rainbow mural there. The photograph, um, or I'm sorry, one of the pieces I thought was particularly important here was a wall that included photographic portraits and biographical information on some of the family members and friends of the victims, as well as survivors and other community members who were personally affected and played a role in the response efforts. It included a photograph of Brandon Wolf, who was at the Pulse nightclub shooting. Um, two of his close friends were killed and he managed to barely escape. Wolf teamed up with friends, and the mother of his best friend, who was killed, and formed the Drew Project in his honor. It is a nonprofit organization that characterizes itself as a LGBTQ plus advocacy organization on a mission to spread love across the nation and promote gay-straight alliances. It was created in honor of Christopher Andrew Leinanen, who went by Drew among his friends. The directors of the organization and Drew's mother have all spoken out for the need for gun reform and have been recognized by the Human Rights Commission, the nation's largest LGBTQ plus rights lobbying uh, group for their work. The Drew Project manages to combine gun violence prevention advocacy work alongside its commitment to supporting the work of GSAs to fight against hate and intolerance. This next photograph 
Um, again, was from that wall that they had um, at that exhibit is of J Jason Lindsay, who uh, in the wake of the Pulse nightclub shooting, created a new political action committee and <coughs> pride fund to end gun violence. He's um, in the past was a congressional relations officer at the Department of Veterans Affairs. And uh, according to their website, the Pride Fund supports candidates who will act on sensible gun policy reforms while champion, championing LGBTQ safety and equality. Um, since we have a little bit more time, I uh, also just wanted to share a couple photos from an exhibit that was um, in a museum in uh, downtown Orlando that um, is not university affiliated, but I've had a very special connection with the curator and um, the folks working there because I gave them all the materials from the exhibit we had done and they were able to use that and um, some of the design work that they had done uh, for their exhibit. And then I went there in person and documented it. So this is the title uh, wall and then there was um, some kind of, what do you call that, fake plastic grass along with um, some of the uh, reproductions, you know, other versions of the original things that had been left um, at some of the spontaneous memorial sites. And it was called One Year Later, reflecting on Orlando's Pulse nightclub massacre, and it also paid tribute to the victims and to the um, first responders. And then this is a photograph um, of some of the crosses that were on display in the exhibit that um, were immediately left at memorial sites. Actually, this one was in front of the hospital, um, that all these 49 crosses were left that were handmade by a carpenter and um, he drove through several states to be able to bring all of these crosses and then people wrote um, messages on them as you can see and they also put photographs of each of the victims on the crosses and um, actually now in Las Vegas I've been working with archivists from University of Nevada Las Vegas and um, looking into the memorial work they've been doing there and so similarly almost identical crosses um, were created in Las Vegas as well and they did have some um, photographs and things mentioning gun violence in this particular exhibit. You can see here the photograph um, on the bottom right there of some of the signs that says hashtag enough gun violence. And then uh, there also was a section where people, um, where they had things that people had um, mailed to the community um, from around the world uh, and around the country. And so um, this one here I think is significant in that there's a sign that says hashtag love to Orlando from Aurora families. And so that's in reference to the um, shooting that happened at a theater in Aurora, Colorado. Um, so part of the reason I wanted to share this image is in terms of thinking about community and the ways in which um, it's a small group of us who are managing these condolence projects and working together and trying to build um, a larger network to share information, resources, provide support. Um, but it had me thinking about some of the questions posed for this conference about community itself. And for me, in the immediate wake of the tragedy, I felt like there was my kind of small immediate community of UCSB and Isla Vista. But um, as it eventually morphed into my dissertation work, I've been um, increasingly working with people around the nation. And so I've been thinking a lot about community in terms of um, kind of that expansion that I personally have experienced and you know it's one thing just to be phone calls and emailing but then to actually meet each other at conferences in person and to be able to have people who are friends who have uh, insight into the type of um, experience you had and the work you're doing that's in many ways quite unusual has been really uh, significant and meaningful for me. Just to conclude, again, thinking about um, community, there's just a little something I wrote. But I wanted to say we are living in a time where the concept of community feels increasingly under attack. We're told by national leaders that we can't trust anyone, that we should fear outsiders, that everyone is focused on their own self-interest, and that the only way to get ahead is at the expense of others. Demagoguery feeds off of ignorance and paranoia. Therefore, perhaps the best panacea is one grounded in a love of community, a resolute declaration of our intentions to heal, to nurture, and to support one another. I don't know what it feels like to have a family member or a best friend killed in a mass shooting, and hopefully I never will. I do know that it is incredibly inspiring to work with the families and friends of victims who continue to amplify their voices on behalf of their loved ones, 
to speak for those who have been silenced. And yet, it shouldn't be up to the family members and friends of gun violence victims to fight this battle of gun reform alone. It shouldn't be up to the survivors to offer up the scars on their bodies as proof of the damage done every day as a result of gun violence epidemic in America. We shouldn't wait until we lose a loved one or until we are the one who is injured. As Richard Martinez said, we don't have to live like this. This is a choice we are making as a nation and is a choice that we should question and challenge together. Thank you. They bring together interdependent people through difference. Secondly, they generate a sense of place, however temporary and transitory. And thirdly, they offer experiences of shared fellowship through diversity. So a description. The place is Studio Theatre, El Chopo University Museum, Mexico City. Five groups of performers from five varied theatre collectives from five states, Jalisco, Oaxaca, Tamaulipas, Yucatan, and Mexico City, stand in a circle on the stage. The auditorium is empty. It's a space with fixed rows of velvet seats facing forward to a proscenium arch stage. Small flights of steps on either side connect the auditorium with the stage. The public enters the back of the studio theatre. As the audience walks through the auditorium and moves to sit at the seats, performers approach them, inviting and encouraging them to walk up the five steps onto the stage as bright stage lights shine down on the gathering assembly. On stage, people walk around and chatter. Before long, the stage contains about 150 people as audience performers mingle and merge. It's not clear who is who. Some wear what seem to be obvious costumes. One wears a uh, one woman wears a charro or a mariachi suit of black jacket and pants with silver buttons down the sides. One wears a large hat and has a moustache stuck on her face. Some are wearing t-shirts with iconic faces of the revolutionary Emiliano Zapata and the words Oaxaca Colectivo. Five wear matching crisp white shirts and neat ties and two young children are carried by two women. All seem to be in a liminal and palimpsest state of subjunctivity, waiting and ready for possibilities. Boundaries between performers and audience are blurred and crossed as the public are invited to be co-participants. For three hours, everybody is on stage together, moving around and being moved around. This performance is the culmination of a year-long project titled Zapata Muerte Sin Fin, or Zapata Death Without End. 
It involved intensive workshop sessions, sharing at distance through virtual technologies and live performance. In the framework of this WHA conference and responding to the question, how can humanities contribute to the creation and the development of communities, I suggest the Sabaka project is a useful model. For three hours, the space is a container of diversity with no objective of generating unity or sameness. The structure involves performers and public co-mingling and co-participating on a theatre stage in Mexico City creating community through collective post-memory. The co-participating audience not only view witness and experience performances by the five original ensembles performance, performance, they also write on stones, listen to stories, throw darts, draw faces, drink mezcal, eat mangoes, smell gasoline, dance together, and finally eat shrimp stew together, before they walk back down the steps, off the stage, through the auditorium, and into the cold night air. I suggest that an experimental process of lab-based theatre and performance can facilitate the creation of intensely felt and transitory communities. So um, for these ideas of community, I'm using these three frameworks. Firstly, drawing on ecology. A community is a group of interdependent organisms of different species, growing or living together in a specific habitat. Secondly, community is a particular area or place considered together with its inhabitants. And thirdly, a feeling of fellowship with others. So um, what I'm going to do now is just briefly describe the ideas of embodied knowledge, expression, and memory. Secondly, performance. And then thirdly, collective post-memory and palimpsest bodies. And I'll move to the model of the Zapata project and finally link these ideas to an undergrad course that I teach here at UCSB. For my methods and experience, I bring to this discussion over 30 years as a creative artist and scholar, trained in Western art music, a junior music scholar at the Guildhall in London, an undergrad degree in music, drama and dance, an interdisciplinary professional performer, a drama and education teacher in Britain in the Marxist tradition, working through issues in live workshops, a community facilitator, head of music in large inner city secondary schools in Birmingham, researcher of 20th century Mexican nationalism and tourism, a professor in the degree of experimental performance making in the UK, and now here, located in a music department in the USA, specifically in the program of ethnomusicology. So, um, these three framing ideas. Firstly, embodied knowledge, expression, and memory. I draw on the ideas of Diana Taylor, a renowned performance studies scholar who draws attention to the value of embodied knowledge, embodied memory, and presence, transmission by being there. In her seminal study, The Archive and the Repertoire, Performing Cultural Memory in the Americas, she particularly advances the importance of recognizing bodies and embodied knowledge as a great value, even as it is frequently devalued or regarded as hierarchically less important than writing. She notes that writing has paradoxically come to stand in for and against embodiment. She discusses the valorization and perpetuation of certain kinds of materials. Quote, the dominance of language and writing has come to stand for meaning itself. Live embodied practices not based in linguistic or literary codes, we must assume, have no claims on meaning. Part of what performance and performance studies allow us to do then is to take seriously the repertoire of embodied practices as important systems of knowing and transmitting knowledge. End of quote. Taylor also describes, quote, embodied expression has participated and will probably continue to participate in the transmission of social knowledge, memory, and identity pre- and post-writing. And finally, if performance did not transmit knowledge, only the literate and powerful could claim social memory and identity. So the second framework is obviously performance. And George Lipstick, Lipsitz, professor here at UCSB, has suggested that communities can be called into being through performance, particularly connecting past and present, describing works of expressive culture as archives of collective struggle, as repositories of collective memory. But it's worth bearing in mind that archives are contingent and transforming. They are, to quote historian Carolyn Steedman, stories caught halfway through the middle of things, discontinuities. And that's in her wonderful book, Dust, the Archive and Cultural History. And then Taylor and Marianne Hirsch refer to the archives in their own study, noting that they may end up, 
quote, as dust, as free-floating data, as traces, or perhaps the memory of traces, dust, data, and traces that will be assembled and reassembled each time in different ways for use in an ever-changing present. And then the third framework is collective memory and palimpsest bodies. So I draw on Marianne Hirsch for the idea of post-memory. She describes an overt relationship between a present generation and past actions, where the relation with the past is active and generative, mediated by imaginative investment, projection, and creation. And I introduce the idea of palimpsest bodies to create performances seeking to explore collective post-memory through cross-temporalities. A palimpsest contains layers, traces, and ephemera. It blurs boundaries and creates productive temporal connections. So palimpsest bodies of collective memory combine present bodies and traces of past bodies of history as remains are reimagined and performed as processes which generate possible futures. So I'm just going to return now to the Sapata project, um, and I will show you a few images here. And I'm just going to flick through these images so you've got a sense of, a slight sense of what this kind of looked like. So this year-long project was part of a diverse body of work created and facilitated by one of Mexico's leading contemporary body-based experimental theatre arts companies, La Máquina de Teatro, The Theatre Machine. Founded and directed by Julián Faisla and Clésio Maleros, this company has consistently worked at the cutting edge of contemporary theatre and scenic arts for over 20 years, creating and facilitating a wide array of performances, laboratories and projects, all of which specifically seek to create and develop senses of community. So how does this project offer useful ethical strategies for creating community? Firstly, at the heart of the project were body-based collective theatre processes for sharing lives through these palimpsest bodies in performance. The year-long project used an open and multi-layered structure which specifically worked through and with bodies and embodied knowledge, expression and memory. For collective post-memory, the project used the core provocation of revolutionary leader Emiliano Zapata, one of Mexico's most iconic figures, and engaged in the questions, what is land, what is liberty, and what is a hero? The project brought a community into being through the involvement of five very different theatre groups. They travelled great distances to be present with each other for intensive workshop sessions and live performance working through these experimental devising strategies. And the five ensembles themselves comprise diverse groups of people who worked with supportive interdependence in their workshops and performances. And in the final performances, the individual public who attended and co-participated added to generate yet another transitory community. The five collectives also shared at distance through virtual technologies. And interestingly, one of the provocations for this conference is is the network the latest form of community now disconnected from the preconditions of shared physical or social space? Well, this project certainly involved a network, five locationally disparate groups seeking collaborative engagement 
with virtual technologies. However, in this case, the shared physical space in workshops and performance was a crucial element in which live bodies interacted through smell, taste, touch, and deeply sensorial experiences. So the second useful ethical strategy for creating a community this project offers is the inclusion of diverse practices and offering a resistance to homogeneity and conformity through a model of radical plurality and diversity, all working through the collective post-memory of Sababa, but this is expressed in multiple embodied forms. And the third ethical strategy involves the co-mingling and the co-participation of performers in public for three hours on a theatre stage through collective post-memory, through a fluid yet structured framework of collective participation comprising fully rehearsed scenarios, improvisational scenarios, and deliberately inclusive scenarios for the public. The event itself created a dynamic liminal community, a complex and chaotic, ever-evolving participatory experience of serious playfulness through imaginative and generative post-memory. The creative stage space is a place of community, transitory but deeply experiential. It's a model of community engagement and difference in the now of the moment, but within the multi-temporal framework, generating an interweaving, intertwining, and an unfolding of socio-political aesthetic. Literally, every body is incorporated into performing palimpsest bodies of multiple journeys, subjectivities, rememories, and revisions, interrelated through the collective post-memory of society. The dynamic space of the workshop and then of the theatre is one of the fellowship and sharing, however transitory. So I turn now to the humanities as ethical practice and questions of value. And I just wanted to pull up three quotes from the WHA website because I have to admit I was not aware of the WHA before this. Uh, or even uh, the, the kind of notions of what humanities and arts, you know, these two words that get bifurcated somehow. So, First quote from the Commission on the Humanities and Social Sciences, which is, the humanities are disciplines of memory and imagination, telling us where we have been and helping us envision where we are going. The second one, American Council of Learning Societies, the humanities compares those fields of knowledge and learning concerned with human thought, experience, and creativity. And the third one is from the Stanford Humanities Center. The humanities can be described as the study of how people process and document the human experience. Since humans have been able, we have used philosophy, literature, religion, art, music, history, and language to understand and record our world. These modes of expression have become some of the subjects that traditionally fall under the humanities umbrella. So, from these, I suggest that embodied knowledge, expression, and memory is crucial for generating community within a value system, and particularly in higher education with undergraduate courses. This requires and facilitates co-mingling and co-participation through and across bodily difference, not seeking to create a unifying aesthetic, technique, or practice or even a linear narrative. Collective post-memory as palimpsest bodies teases out layers, traces, moments, ephemera, a form of humane humanness, which is appropriate for creating communities through humanities. And I want to quote from Brazilian performance of this artist and scholar, Eleanor Fabio, in her chapter, History and Precariousness. And through this poetic and insightful exposition, she describes the complexities of multi- and atemporal coexistence in relation to imagination and sensorial perception. So this is a quote. In a corporeal sense, the so-called past is neither gone nor actual. It's neither exactly accumulative, nor does it simply vanish. The body intertwines imagination, memory, sensorial perception and actuality in very sophisticated ways. The body itself moves according to these intertwinements, 
while permanently producing new mnemonic, sensorial, actual, and imaginative connections that generate movement. In a corporeal sense, the past is a becoming. End quote. So, as practice is putting theories into practice, then these embodied expressions of commingling multi aesthetic, open and fluid performance frameworks allow people to play with iterations, presence, accumulation, and evidence. These performative processes are capable of challenging prejudice, insularity, and of questioning established hierarchies and stereotypes to offer multiple relational and fluid relations of difference. Uh, so finally, I turn to the question again, how can humanities contribute to the creation and development of communities? And I offer a second model, which is close to here. So inside a small black box studio on the UCSB campus, 18 or so people mingle around the space. They move, gesture, laugh, perform. For 10 weeks, for two hours, 50 minutes each week, the space of T1703 becomes a space and place of intense community. This is my course, Creating Experimental Performance, Memories, Histories, Processes, Practices. And to quote from my course syllabus, collaboration and shared learning. As this is an experimental workshop-based course, you'll collectively work with classmates, developing ideas of performance work. This requires trust and sensitivity to each other. The class should be a safe space in which you can all explore new ideas. Much of the learning depends on reflecting on each other's creative and analytical ideas. One of the most valuable experiences is engaging with the ongoing new performances that you create. Together, the undergraduate students are diverse but interdependent. They create, discuss, and move through a fluid yet structured framework of collective and body participation. Through ideas of palimpsest bodies and post-memory, of performances as discontinuities, as co-mingling, they create different work, they stimulate and they surprise. They create performances of work in progress, not a performance for an outside audience, but for the inside community of themselves and me. We are the community, transitory but humane. They express their sense of fellowship for and with each other. And I suggest that poetic, aesthetic, sensorial and imaginative co-mingling performing bodies are fundamental to future generations of transitory, diverse and interdependent communities. And I'll just again put up a few images from the course here at uh, TD 1703 and for some of those who recognise it you'll also see the labyrinth here. So finally, I want to finish by inviting you to consider your own body now, in this moment, and as you co-mingle, eat, drink, and experience each other's company as community. Research. It seems as though you were um, acknowledging the pain, mm -hmm. but what about action? Mm -hmm. that, that would be my question. What is the action from all this pain? And then I guess for our other speaker, uh, Ruth, uh, can you please talk about your pedagogy or methodology in performance? Like what type of history of performance are you drawing from? So I'm drawing on many different 
pedagogical trajectories actually. So some of it comes out of co-op, so some of it comes through theatre the oppressed. Um, and for those of you that know about 1980s drama education, theatre and education in Britain, um, there's a very strong trajectory there which is kind of quashed by Margaret Thatcher, which is a very uh, Marxist um, pedagogical drama uh, within, a, uh, within a classroom situation actually. Um, but I'm also very much drawing on some of the big uh, methodologies like Meyerhold, for example. So big uh, Grotowski, big body-based um, pedagogies. So um, th there's actually a, full, a, a whole range there because what's happened over the last 30 years is I tend to kind of weave in and out of things and draw on the different um, uh, experiences in a sense. Uh, and I'm also particularly with a company, that La Magna de Teatro, um, Juliana particularly works with viewpoints. Some of you will know that from Anne Bogart. Um, so it's this idea of perspectives, but again, working in a space, not kind of working by writing. Um, and then also Clarissa, she's actually trained with Jacques de Cook. So she comes through this idea of pedagogical playfulness and always looking to be creative in any single moment, um, both kind of as an individual but within a collective as well. Um, in the classroom situation here in TD1903 for my particular course, I'm very much drawing on um, these, I'm drawing on the, the kind of Boal, uh, Theatre of the Oppressed, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, uh, or Freya, if you like, sorry, for Pedagogy of the Oppressed. Um, I'm drawing on the physicality of Maya Holt, Grotowski, um, of Lecoq, of Viewpoints, and I'm drawing on many of the processes that I was using in the 1980s as a creative performer, actually, as well. Um, so there's a lot of different ones, actually. <laughs> and it's kind of interesting that I don't tend to, it's, it, I tend to just kind of have this mixture there. So I'm not following a particular, particular pedagogical path of trajectory, but I am drawing from many. Because also, because I was trained as a classical musician as well, so I had this kind of, you know, you practice piano for four hours a day, and then you practice violin for eight, four hours a day. Um, so that combines with some of the very experimental work that I was doing in the early 1980s as well. So it, it's almost like I'm coming at this from so many directions, but then also having facilitated work with different communities, in, in, for example, in elders' homes, um, in um, uh, people who just, come out of prisons, um, it, it just it's all a different uh, kind of project-based work. So it was always a case of responding. So I think one of the pedagogies is actually the pedagogy of response and working with rather than imposing on. So I tend to be um, trying to respond very fast to who I'm with and picking up what they're doing and what their needs are actually. And I, I do think that I managed to do that with my undergrads, because even in the six years I've been here, they're changing. You know, every time I have a new, because they don't know each other, of course, they just come to the space to start the course and they're for 10 weeks, two hours, 15 minutes a week. Um, and I have noticed, even in those six years, the, the differences, actually. So when I teach this again, starting in January, I will then work with those students who are there in that space in that first week and try to work out what their needs are and therefore how I can facilitate them in this. So facilitatory response pedagogy is definitely part of this. Well, thank you for your question. Um, I think in terms of the idea of action, um, first I'll say when there's trauma, these types of um, you know horrible um, crime sprees and, and tragedies that um, People tend to heal and, and process and go through grief in a whole lot of different ways. And so I definitely see, you know, when it comes to mass killings in terms of gun violence, I see, you know, a lot of um, families and survivors moving towards that activism um, as a way to kind of also heal through politics. Um, and so I would say for me personally, that's also been an important part of the work that I'm doing um, to, again, think of the word fellowship, which I think is really important um, I kind of see myself in fellowship with um, the families in terms of doing that work as well um, to be honest you know as a researcher as a PhD student here for me first it was more of the focus on documentation memorialization um, 
I've always cared about gun violence prevention, but I didn't have any real knowledge or background until this happened. Um, but really, being, I think, open is so important, so I'm really open to learning from the families, um, as well as, you know, working with them just in whatever capacities um, really are meaningful. And so, well, so I've been quite active around gun violence prevention. I didn't go as much into the work that I've been doing, um, but I see it as really part of my healing process as well. Honestly, um, people tend to think it's kind of macabre to say that you're helping create national networks around how to respond to these tragedies in terms of assisting archivists, historians, because you're doing it in this future-oriented way of just being realistic and assuming this is gonna continue as of right now and that you need to help give people tools and resources to be able to do this type of work in these communities. And so frequently people will ask me, what about the prevention side? It's like you're giving up or something by focusing on the response, on the aftermath, and uh, I don't see it that way. I see it more as when you've personally experienced it and you know how hard it is not to have resources or a network or know where to turn to, um, it's, you know, it, it helps you realize that need, but it also, I think, is healing for those of us doing this work that even while we're managing our own projects, we're trying to think about how to make it easier for people in the future. But I feel like those have to be um, kind of occurring at the same time for me personally is to be thinking about change, um, you know, prevention, but also thinking about the reality of response. Uh, very interesting presentations, thank you. Um, I think I wanted to ask uh, both of you a question. Um, Melissa, I wanted to ask you, and it's interesting that gun violence, preventing gun violence, is sort of the political response rather than other kinds of things. Because I mean, if we look at the panorama of violence, um, it includes other kinds of issues like mental health and the you know public health, um, the privatization of healthcare, the exclusion of people with mental health problems. It, it involves the idea of the definition of who's a terrorist and who isn't. And I mean these, so, um, and, and in a kind of similar way, there's a sort of a particularization of the um, scenes and the context that you're looking at, but there's also sort of a, a universalization of these symbols that you're which, in some ways, like the crosses, make me question what, how, how that's imposed, um, rather than um, allowing people to find ways, you know, and, and as, a, as a curator, as an archivist, you know, sort of spreading these symbols in different places. So I, I wondered if you could speak to those, and, and um, you're very interesting presentation, I have a lot of questions, um, but one would be, how do you do a syllabus? Mm -hmm. Interesting, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yes. Do me to go first? Or? Yeah, yeah um, Okay, let me think. So, in terms of, yeah, so I totally agree in terms of how complex these situations are, and even with our own tragedy here, if we think again, even saying the word tragedy, right, tragedy versus massacre versus killing, like, you know, the terminology varies so greatly in terms of the tone you're setting, who you're interacting with, um, in those ways. And so, you know, definitely uh, in the wake of what occurred here, students, you know, I, I was teaching as a grad student at the time, students definitely would say, well, I don't know how to even make sense of this, you know, is it about gun violence? Is it about mental health? Is it about violence against women, which I didn't really, because of time, go into great detail on here, but um, that was a really key issue too in the wake of our tragedy. Um, thinking about race was an issue. There were just so many uh, different issues, and, and I know it's really hard to hear, but that's why I think it's also important to mention that this was a complex um, you know, violence free that involved guns, as well as knives, as well as a vehicle, right? So a lot of times, then we have like bombings, you know, 
know, Oklahoma City Memorial Museum, 9-11 Museum in New York. So those are also folks I work with who are um, having projects around other things than mass shootings. To be honest, I don't know that I would have necessarily gotten so focused around gun violence in particular if it weren't for the families of the victims. Um, specifically, Rich Martinez and Bob Weiss really making that move and gesture and me kind of um, building trust in that relationship and kind of meeting the folks where they're at in that way. But I will say, you know, channeling Rich and Bob, like, when it comes to gun violence, um, if we do just think about something like Las Vegas, though, right, where I'm not even going to remember the exact number, but I believe it was, I think I said 60-something people killed, but 546 injured, and that was in eight minutes. So while you can have tragedies that involve, you know, um, vehicles, we just had one the other day, right, in Manhattan, where um, struck by a, a car, or you can have knives and things. If we think about scale, magnitude, and if we think about the exponential growth that we've seen in terms of mass shootings in particular, as well as the high casualty numbers, I think that that does warrant some serious thought and contemplation around kind of where we're headed as a nation or what those particular values are that we hold in terms of life. Um, and in terms of, yes, like the religious iconography that you see with the crosses and all of those types of things, you know, a lesbian, atheist, leftist, not necessarily comfortable with the whole religious aspect that does come in time and time again, but yet I've spent, you know, lots of time with the families of our victims while they're in prayer holding their hands because that's what they wanted and needed at that moment. So sometimes for me it's a little bit more of just realizing your subject position and what the wants and needs are of the community and especially those who are closest to the violence and kind of letting that drive things. I don't know if that really addresses what you're saying, but that's kind of my way of wrapping around some of this. Yeah, so <laughs> it, it, um, you know, the question is what do you, how do you enable students to engage with something? I, I do find the system here quite complicated because we only have 10 weeks. Um, which is not very long to get from you know start to finish, um, because the students I'm teaching in that course, they uh, I've never met them before. They mostly don't know each other, and they're not either theatre or music majors. Some are, but some aren't. You know, so actually it's it's interesting, and again I tweak it or I change it rather every year. Um, and what was striking me then was the kind of blocks that I had on those images coming up there, which is kind of not a sense of this intertwining that I'm talking about with the co-mingling. So what I'm trying to do with, with the syllabus is to set out something that will allow the students to as quickly as possible connect with the key ideas of, of really my expectations for the course as well, because one of the issues here is that they're going to be assessed in 10 weeks' time. They, they have to have a grade. And because I'm actually dealing a lot with body work, which doesn't seem to, in a dance department, that's fine. You know, you, you're always dealing with moving bodies. And, and I was struck by a headline in the UCSB News two days ago, which says, dance your PhD. And I thought, great, this is, you know, they talked. But no, it was a mathematician. So this idea that you could actually dance as a dancer for your PhD somehow doesn't quite resonate in this country. It does in Britain, it has done for a very long time. So I'm in a different system here where I'm trying to enable these students to value the knowledge that they have in their own bodies, that they don't have to write about that. Um, and that's quite hard to get across because I'm actually writing about it. <laughs> so there's always a paradox. And we talk about the paradoxes, of course, as well. And that's part of the context. So. <laughs> Thank you very much. So I'm not sure exactly what my question is, but I have some thoughts that maybe you could respond to. I think that both of you are implicitly raising questions about the differences and maybe the similarities between public and private memory, or individual and collective memory. And implicitly, well perhaps more explicitly in your case, behind your work is the memorialization of the Holocaust, because Marianne Hirsch is a Holocaust right. scholar. Her notion of post-memory is a specific kind of trauma and intergenerational transmission. Yeah. When one is talking about artifactual, artifactual commemoration, I think it's impossible 
not to think about, for example, the, the U.S. Holocaust Memorial Museum and what it means to isolate and display artifacts. There's always a gesture towards some kind of meaning. And um, Melissa, you even said explicitly, um, you're trying, you were interested in drawing larger meanings from this mass killings, and then as was pointed out, you went in the direction of gun control. But I, I just think that these are complicated issues, and I'm wondering if you could talk about, I mean, for example, if one's talking about the Holocaust, one wouldn't formulate it in terms of speaking for those who have been silenced. In fact, the work of commemoration is keeping spaces open, not filling in voices. Um, again, the kind of, uh, what I drew from your uh, presentation was that it's the transitoriness that becomes pedagogical because you're teaching perhaps skills that one needs to build community in more enduring, sustained ways. But, so my, I don't know if there's a question, but I just, I think that when you're doing this work, the issue of individual and collective and the politicization of memory and why and the creation of meaning is worth addressing. Yeah, and I totally agree because I've actually just finished writing this book, which is called For Forming Palimpsest Bodies Close to Memory. It's about this theatre company and four particular projects. This is just one project, actually. Um, and they are, what's striking me about their work is how they're actually literally working through the body, and therefore it is not fixed, it's always fluid, because our bodies are fluid, and they're always, always changing. That's inherent in the body, that our body right now is not the same as it was five, min five minutes ago. So there's an inherent fluidity to that. It doesn't fix it, and I think it's very different to the idea of an artifact, um, which actually does tend to create this sort of static memory. And it's interesting with the notion of post-memory, because Again, just applying it to when I'm dealing both with students and I'm dealing with the company in Mexico City, or the company is rather I'm dealing with, they're dealing with, if you like, 600 years of post memory. So I'm extending the temporal frame um, because it's like 500 years from the invasion of Hernan Cortez, but of course, then the, the sense of these resonances then. And so it's actually extending Marianne Hirsch's idea. To multi because actually, again, this is what the company is doing. So I'm picking up on their sense of how they are living these multiple histories through their bodies in the present moment, and then how that gets played out. And interestingly, with the students, um, again, because I'm facilitating what they want to work on in a way, and some of them are dealing with very specific recent events that um, have heavily impacted them. For example, the fire in San Francisco, oh, I think it was last year, it was a warehouse fire. Um, and then I've also had students, so you could say that's it was very personal to this particular student, but curiously, I'm wearing an artifact. <laughs> this particular student made um, bracelets for all of us, me and all the students, um, which was related to memories that we started off the course with. And so I'm actually carrying around an artifact, which is kind of interesting. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, other students, but they certainly don't have to do anything like that. So there's an openness there for them to respond to what ideas about memory might be there for, um, whether they want to make it kind of personal or whether it's actually a very distant, you know, distant in different centers, temporal or locationally. Um, but at the end of the course, there is no fixing of everything. And that's what's interesting about that space. It is a black box space. There's nothing in it. The students bring stuff that they're working with, but then at the end of it, the very final photographs were really eating, eating pizza, because that's how the course finishes. Um, and actually, there are no tangible traces, in a sense. So I'm definitely dealing with this idea of ephemera and post-memory as ephemera, um, and trying to facilitate them also to, to actually not think of developing community as a long term thing necessarily, but actually there is value in a transitory community. And that yes, when they go out of that room at the end of those 10 weeks, they may not see each other again, they probably won't, you know. But there was great value in those. So actually the idea of a transitory community um, is equally valuable. And
and um, that that fellowship in the moment but through experience kind of will stay with you in different ways, but we don't have to pin it down. So, so in terms of thinking about individual and collective memory, uh, private and public, and thinking about the Holocaust Memorial and Museum in Washington, D.C., I think that there is a lot of correlation, though, between that and some of these different <coughs> memorial exhibits um, that I was speaking about, um, specifically ours and then the one at the very end that was at the History Museum there. Again, in terms of thinking about the anonymity of mass death, mass killings, and like trying to individualize. I don't know, maybe you're, you're wanting to interject. Yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, Right. Yeah, so all I was going to say is in terms of um, choosing to kind of as much as possible individualize like that person who's been killed, whether, you know, in the Holocaust Memorial Museum, I'm thinking about the shoes, which shows the mass kind of uh, larger collective, but then also the, um, I remember there's a bridge where there's the photographs of different people living in this town, and I believe it was Poland who were, um, you know, killed, and the, almost all of them in this town and really the importance of like photographs and people and focusing like uh, on those individual lives and so when you're sometimes of course yes it's curating is totally about editing right and thinking about selection subjectivity of like what you choose to take to represent um, individuals as well as making like a larger story or making a larger statement you know and I think that um, for us, you know, like the, the most difficult objects to deal with with our exhibit were things that were personal to the victims. That, in one instance, um, Veronica's uh, sorority sisters took her shoes out of her closet and wanted to leave them there at the memorial site. Um, to be honest, they're still in my possession. The library's not sure yet if they want them. If the families are going to want the shoes back, I have a lot of you know emotional intense work that I do um, for sure. And you know, Katie had a, a scarf that also was left um, at one of the sites that was deeply meaningful for the families to see those objects and, and think about it. But you know, it should be clear too that with our um, exhibit here, uh, the families have totally, well most of the families have been very um, able to kind of get along and, and see things around gun violence prevention, but I don't also want to make it sound like monolithic in the presentation I've given in terms of different people being in very different places with things in terms of politics and emotions. And so um, part of what I see is having to um, think about these memorial spaces in terms of um, the multiple functions they play around healing, but also perhaps politics, showing like just the different ways that people react to a situation. So I don't know if I'm really kind of dancing around your question a bit, but um, I think that when you mentioned, you know, not seeing the Holocaust Memorial Museum as speaking for those who've been silenced, in some ways, I don't know, my reading's a little bit different. I actually, from going through the museum kind of and, and reading Ed Linenthal's book too, um, about the creation, the making of the Holocaust Memorial Museum, for me in some ways it does feel like there's lots of voids and absence and silence, but in some, time, in some ways silence kind of is speaking to me when I go through a place like that. We have time for one more question, I think. Thanks for your talks. I have a question specifically for Ruth. And it, um, it struck me that an interesting tension was emerging in your talk between, uh, on the one hand, your, your careful attention to embodied knowledge and describing performance in terms of emplacement and ecologies. I love that, that, um, that kind of metaphor. And the category of the human. Um, and specifically the, the moment we were, I think, quoting uh, the, the sort of mission statement of the Stanford Humanities Center as, you know, being about capturing the human experience. And um, of course, we're not the only ones with bodies, right? Um, and, and you even used this, um, the discourse of species at one point in your talk. And so it, it just sort of raised a question for me. Um, to what extent do you think we need to sort of retain or um, dispense with the category of the human and, and sort of look towards the humanities um, without humanism? 
uh, or is that actually an important thing to sort of foreground and capture? Um, well, I, it, it is important because I'm dealing with the species human, and my students are human. But at the same time, I am looking to um, develop um, courses, or a course in particular, which actually does deal much more specifically with interactions. Of, I, I actually love, there's a quote by Dana Taylor, which is, um, oh, I'm going to forget it now. Uh, it's how our, how we're coextensive with our environment. Our bodies are coextensive with our environment. Um, whether the environment in the biggest sense of the word of other species, obviously, um, everything other than us, these the species of humans. Um, and so I'm actually, and it, it's interesting how with the students they do that anyway, but they're already moving into other areas in what they're doing. Um, so it, there's definitely not a sort of exclusion there. But at the same time, I've created a focus on the idea of memories and histories, except that the word histories then definitely incorporates histories of environments, if you like. Um, and we definitely move into that. And it's interesting, that very quick moment you saw up on the labyrinth, which if you're not used to UCSB, I encourage you to go up there, despite not particularly what it is. There's a labyrinth right on the edge of the ocean. So we actually work in the labyrinth on the edge, if you like, of the ocean. You know, this idea of a border, a boundary, a crossing. Um, this place which is not my land, it's not their land, it's not anybody's land, um, except that it was, it has all these multiple histories. Um, and so actually when we do that work, there's definitely a sense of trying to go beyond the human, um, trying to interact. And again, I'm trying to respond to their understandings. So there is definitely a tension there, and that's a very deliberate tension. And I, I try to work with those dynamic tensions as well to set up. Uh, again, if anybody you know, a wonderful performance artist in Mexico called Jesus Rodriguez, and she has this wonderful thing about ambiguity. She's celebrating the idea of ambiguity. Um, and I use a particular quotation of hers again, uh, which is about uh, both humour and ambiguity. So again, that's the part of what I'm dealing with, which tries to verge into taking the humanities uh, beyond humans, actually, um, into a much more ambiguous situation, which, um, which again, it's very interesting with the undergrads to see how they deal with the tensions that they're living with right now as well. So that probably didn't quite answer it, except that it's set me off thinking as well. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for your